All right. Hey, guys, Dr. Greg here on The Daily Dose with Dr. Greg. And on today's episode, I have a hormone coach with me. I have Miss Leah Brueggemann, and I'm excited to chat. I would say as a functional medicine doctor myself, um, 70 plus percent of women, when they come to us with, with their concerns, something revolves around hormones. So Leah is a, is a yeah. hormone coach. She's a certified functional diagnostic nutritional practitioner. We're going to dive into that a little bit. And she is the host of Balancing Hormones Naturally, which is one of the top health podcasts. So Leah, it is a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I followed you on social media, so it's a pleasure to chat with you. And, and likewise, we've probably creeped each other a little bit in the podcast world. And yep. I think we treat, um, you know, there's a similar population, right? We have women that respectfully are like, you know what, how I feel it's not okay. And I've probably yeah. been to my doctor. I've been to places and they're like, no, nah, you're fine. And yet they're like, no, I'm not fine. Like this is uh, how I'm feeling is not okay. So let's, so we'll talk about social media and TikTok. I'd love to tell you how I got into TikTok because it was kind of a dare and here we are, but let's back the truck up for you, girl. Let's back the truck up before TikTok and before becoming uh, an, an FDNP, like like growing up, were you into wellness or kind of what was your journey and how'd you end up to where you are today? Take us on a little, a little ride. Well, my mom was always into alternative holistic health. So I do have to say, I think that when I got sick, that kind of made me look in that direction. But growing up, I was very anti-health stuff like Skittles for breakfast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought it was good. Um, and I was just your typical, like, you know, could live off of no sleep, you know, for a certain amount of time right. and ate all of the food. I was super tiny. So it was never like an issue with metabolism. You know, I feel like sometimes if you start gaining weight, like you'll start to look into other issues, but like, I just was, I was an athlete mm -hmm. and I just kept going. And then I went to college for music actually very different space. Um, and I thought it would be a great idea to double major in piano and voice. Oh, wow. And I became a music director at a church at the same time. So I'm like, have all these pots going. And I graduated and I was so tired. Okay. And I was like, I just need to like get some sleep. I just need to catch up on sleep. And so that was the goal was just catch up on sleep. Okay. And I would sleep like 10 plus hours a night and I'd be exhausted. And then I did a self breast exam, which everybody should do those. And I found a lump about the size of a golf ball. Wait, wait, you're like 22 years old at this time. Give or 21. take 20. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So I, I want to unpack a few things. Um, I love music. What sports yes. did you play growing up? Volleyball. Oh, so way cool. I, yeah. I played volleyball all through high school and then I coached. Um, oh my gosh. It was so much fun. So, so little correlation. I was actually in a men's choir in college, 85 oh, guys in one room. Like the sound was just amazing. And I actually yes. took guitar uh, as an undergrad class. And I felt so guilty that I was spending my tuition money on a music class because I was raised yeah. in this house where like, like I was going to school to be a doctor and, you know, medicine, medicine, medicine. Mm -hmm. So the two classes that I probably had the most fun in in college were ballroom dance and guitar. <laughs> They're, they're good for your creative juices. Oh my gosh, girl. You so, okay. So then, so double major voice. And, and piano, um, did a bunch of work at a church. So, and then now 21 and you have a golf ball size lump. Yeah. Wow. And I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and so I called my mom because, you know, that's what you do when things go wrong. Right. And she's like, you better get into the doctor. So, okay. um, when they knew my age, they got me in like super fast and, I ended up on getting an ultrasound because I was too young for a mammogram Okay. and they diagnosed me with fibroadenomas, which are benign breast tumors. Okay. If people do not know, because I had to Google that <laughs> they're right. like, Oh, it's benign. It's a fibroadenoma. And I'm just looking at her. My expression is still completely blank. Like what on earth is that? Right. Um, and they were, <sighs> The way they presented it was, heaven forbid, I don't get this removed, but I should at least get it biopsied. Like, it was it was a very interesting conversation. It was kind of like, 
let's not scare you, but scare you at the same time. Totally. And so I left and I didn't know what to do. So that's when I started talking to um, pretty much everybody that I could pull in the alternative health. So anybody that my mom had ever been to um, in the functional world, I was like, have you ever heard of fiber adenomas? What on earth are these? Because I didn't know. And Dr. Google is kind of scary. So (laughs) don't go down that. Right. Um, And what I found is that the large majority, pretty much all of them, return post-surgery if you do not figure out what's causing them. And so I'm like, that sounds great. I'm self-employed, right? I'm a musician and I'm going to fork over thousands and thousands of dollars for that. I do not have for a surgery that they'll probably just come back. And I'm like, that's pointless. I love, I love you saying that because I always believe that the body responds appropriately to its environment, right? So if there was an environment in my body that formed a fibroadenoma, for example, and we didn't figure out why the fibroadenoma was there and we just lopped it out, it's going to come back. Just like you said, this statistically, it's going to come back. And then here you are again going and, and medicine would just be like, well, we'll cut it out again when it comes back. And then there's that, exactly. that part of your spirit. That's like, ah, that doesn't resonate. That doesn't make sense to me. Right. Mm-hmm. Huh. So, so it, it sounds like it happened for you, right? There was like a huge turning point in your journey, girl. Yes. Love it. So yes. continue on. Yes. Even with all my Skittles and caffeine at this point. Um, So I am very thankful like that I had that bringing up for my mom to like look in other directions because otherwise I would have just gone and gotten it cut out and um, undergone a surgery. But so that became my journey was to get rid of my fiber adenomas. And the very specific part about this is in my head, I just had to get rid of my fiber adenomas right now. I had not made any correlation to anything else. And Every doctor I had gone to, which like, I'm sure you know this in the field, not all doctors, not all practitioners, not everyone's created equal in. So you think like you're heading into this, you know, alternative health, like they all know the same stuff, right? I should be good. Mm -hmm. So not true. Right. Um, I, every single one was like, had this magic solution, you know, for my fiber adenomas. Like, oh, I can get rid of those. Like, it's just an estrogen issue. And I had so many labs run. I had heavy metal gene tests, like all sorts of stuff. Okay. And 99% of them came back normal. Okay. And so all they did was put me on this super restrictive diet and I spent literally thousands of dollars in supplements. And during this time, nobody asked me about my cycles. Nobody asked me about my periods. Mm. It's always very focused on my fiber adenomas. It has to be like a nutrition thing. You have to be super restrictive. And all this did was give me a horrible relationship with food and think that I had to go on a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day diet Mm -hmm. And that was it. I could go back to what I was doing before. I just had to fix the issue and continue on. All right. So curiosity has the cat here. Talk to me about what your cycles were like at that time that had all of these answers sitting inside of those questions. Well, I had basically no cycles. That was the issue. (laughs) They were super irregular. And I would have like a 30-day cycle. And then it would be gone yeah. for like 90, 100 days. Yeah. And the thing is, I had, so I was rooming with some friends at this time. Mm-hmm. And we were going on a trip. And they're like, oh, I need to bring tampons. I'm going to be on my period. And the look on my face was just like, you know? Right. Like, it's predictable. Like, yeah. I was like, wait a second. And so she's like, yeah, my period comes like every 28 days. And I'm like, that. That's not right. Mine, I have no idea when it's coming. Yeah. So that is what kind of started the journey. I was like, okay, why is my cycle weird? And what I know now, looking back, I wasn't ovulating. And so, of course, my estrogen was high. There, there was no progesterone to counteract my estrogen. But you know what everybody's solution was at that point? Because they would run a hormone mm-hmm. panel was you need progesterone cream. Right. Right. And instead of like, why are you not ovulating? Okay. 
And I had debilitating periods. When it actually showed up, I would be on your highest dose of Midol and I would be puking. Oh my gosh. I would have to call in. I couldn't go into work. Yeah. And I would just like lay there with a hot, like a heating pad. And that was my normal. I just, you know, when I first got my period, horrible cramps. I would like call my mom Mm -hmm. at school and be like, I'm sick. And she would have to come pick me up. That's wild. Hey, hold that thought where you are. Um, We're going to jump into a commercial break and my kids are outside the door making way too much noise. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying today's episode of The Daily Dose with Dr. Greg. Please stick around for a quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back to our conversation with Leah Brueggemann. Life Boost Coffee offers an incredible variety of organic coffees, and there's an additional benefit to Life Boost. All Life Boost coffees are low acid, which means that if you've had to cut back on coffee before because it irritates your gut, you can enjoy Life Boost without any issues. People are often amazed at the difference between Life Boost and other coffees. For example, Life Boost doesn't sit on store shelves for months. There's no fresher way to get coffee, and it's delivered right to your door. Since you're listening to my podcast right now, they are running a 50% off special for your first order. Go to lifeboostdeal.com. Thanks for tuning into the Daily Dose with Dr. Greg. If you've found value in what you're listening to, we encourage you to go check out Leah's website. Head to leahbrugeman.com or look for a link in this episode's show notes. Let's jump back into our conversation with Leah and Dr. Greg. All right, so we are jumping into your cycle. There's this conversation of all you need is progesterone cream. And I'm guessing you were like, I'll give it a shot or kind of, yep. what, so, so walk me through that. I tried it. Um, progesterone cream made me cycle. I literally turned into a monster person. Like my moods would go crazy. I would just pick a fight with anybody and everybody. And the only time I finally made the connection was like, they decided to have me start cycling it. And so I started cycling it and I was like, wait a second, when I'm not on this, I'm normal. Like I'm, I'm human. Okay. But as soon as I get on it, I just want to fight with everybody. Okay. So I just threw it in the garbage. All right. So check off that box. And two, I was taught in some functional medicine training that you cycle it. You take it the second half of the cycle and then come off during menses. And on day 14, you start again. That didn't work for you. No. So did not. check off the progesterone box. What's next yeah. on your journey? I went through some severe like gut programs, tried all of the like, because, you know, everyone says it starts in your gut. So, you know, I went on a cookie cutter program that was programmed by some doctor and some guy probably. It was. (laughs) (laughs) No, totally get it, girl. Uh, It did not work. And I just remember like, and then at this point, I actually went to a naturopath and he ran some more labs and he put me on this diet. And I remember I reran my labs with him like two months later. And he's like, oh, there's, there's no improvements. So you have to continue on what you're doing. And I just, I sat on the couch and I bawled. I was like, you let me eat like potatoes and chicken. <laughs> You know, like it was just so restrictive and I was like, okay, the only thing keeping me going at this point is like, there's an end in this like tunnel. Um, And during this time, my fibratinomas didn't budge. Like they were still huge. And at this point we had found out I had multiple ones. Okay. So that's when I, at this point, um, I was getting married soon and I started tracking my cycle more consistently. And this is when I was like, I'm not ovulating and I want to have kids. So Mm -hmm. this is an issue. Right. And that's when I stopped going to the doctors and I was like, you know what? Let's look into what's going on a different way. So when you say tracking for the listeners, like, were you doing like basal body temps? Were you looking at mucus? Like, how are you doing hormone, your cycle tracking? Yep. So I started doing cervical mucus and temp tracking and my temps were really low and I didn't have a like temp spike at all. So I knew I wasn't ovulating and then cervical mucus like confirmed that. So I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, we have an issue, Right. you know? So much like you, I kind of have those natural parents. Like my grandpa 
My mom comes from that natural side. And my parents, I come from a good little Catholic family. My parents taught natural family planning when I grew up. So my parents like taught like couples how to, you know, the good Catholics, how to do this stuff. So I grasp yeah. the concept of, yeah, those things. So, But it works, right? If you know what you're yep. testing for, it can really tell you some answers. It really can. And that's, I think that, you know, we don't understand the power of our cycle in that way. Like if I hadn't been tracking, you know, if you go in, for example, to go get a hormone panel, like it's helpful to know where you are in your cycle. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, I see so many women will come to me now and they're like, well, I didn't have any progesterone. So they want to put me on suppository. And I'm like, okay, when did you test? Well, we tested on like day seven of my cycle. I'm like, well, of course you don't have progesterone. You aren't producing it. Right. So, I think it's such a valuable tool. So at this point, I was just like, whatever is going on here is not working. And so that's when I just kind of threw everything out the window, um, which saved me a lot of money because I was spending a lot of money on like random supplements. And you needed to spend money on a wedding at this point in time because you were about to get hitched. Yeah, I love it. Yes, I was. Um, This almost sounds like a movie so far, Leah. Like you have this, like there's this villain and the villain creates all this carnage and you try all these things, man, the, the, the savior has to show up quick here. So we now know that that, that it's not a diet issue. It's not a progesterone issue. It's not a, a gut cleanse issue. And in lieu of all of that, which are not bad things, but even if I tell people, if you do the right thing at the wrong time, it's still the wrong thing. So now through old school hormone tracking, you realize, I'll be damned, I'm not even ovulating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Throw everything out. What's your next step? I started working on foundations. So this is when I started being like, okay, I'm not even having regular bowel movements every day. So how do we get that? Like, let's start with the basics. Right. And so we started there, started um, getting rid of endocrine toxin disruptors in my house. I'd never at this point, no one had told me to like check my cleaning supplies. I would get headaches from cleaning the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So I just started throwing stuff out and replacing and stopped stressing, just started like, let's make sure we're having daily bowel movements. Let's get our water in. Mm -hmm. Let's eat to nourish. So eat to feel good. So how did I feel after that meal? Okay, didn't feel super great. Let's try something else. I, I want to. I I, what do you think are the top three things sitting in a listener's house right now, unbeknownst to them, that are straight up jacking up their hormones? Okay, those the free breeze air fresheners. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you have those, they have to go. Okay, that would be number one. Um, okay, I can only pick three. Okay, oh, just, or, or, or two, rattle a list, girl. Maybe you have a huge list that you do. I would definitely check your air fresheners. Mm-hmm. Number two, I would check your your skincare and your beauty because you're putting it on your skin every right. single day. Totally. And I see this as a such a huge issue with fertility. So that would be another one. And then definitely your cleaning supplies because you're yeah. cleaning your tables. You're probably cutting your food on your tables right. and then you're eating it. So true. And then... These are just things I would probably just toss right away. And then the other one, and this isn't necessarily like a thing, but believing that there's a magic pill out there for you instead of like knowing that you know what you need to do. You just need to do it. So true. I love that. I love that when people probably find you or they find us, they've tried everything. Yeah. Right. So I say, hey, if you are looking for a magic program or a magic pill or an easy button, by now you know that those don't exist. So I love that. I would probably maybe add to that list. I'm a big I'm a big uh, thyroid checker. So I would say fluoride, yeah. fluoridated toothpaste. Oh yeah. And then when I think of anything like with the breast tissue and the lymphatic tissue, most women are using Cute, antidepressant, right? right? So aluminum zirconium is that darn active ingredient. That we mm-hmm. know, I mean, just think you're putting this stuff on your armpits, which is where you have yep. tons of lymphatic tissue. And there's actually pretty good research about um, aluminum and Parkinson's. And two, for women with breast tissue, which I guess is every person in this world, the part of the tissue that actually gets impacted is the axilla, right? So way up by the armpit. And, and when you're when you're not allowing the lymphatic system to do its job, it can get backed up. So, mm-hmm. so and here's the thing. What I heard you say is, you know, don't freak out. Just control what you can control. Start yeah. to clean things out. And what I would, I guess what I, if I was to give a, a, a tip to the listener, I'd say like, 
don't if you're that person that needs to throw everything out go for it or maybe if you're like that person that's really conservative just when it's time to buy the next thing just yep. make a better choice right because yeah it's even though there isn't a magic pill it takes time to do all this so so cool so so we're pooping we got stuff cleaned yeah. out of the house we're cleaning up our makeup and then what are and then talking you the term you also said is you talked about eating intuitively right yeah. like how do i feel after i eat that do i feel nourished am i full or am i bloaty am i brain foggy do i feel like i'm getting a, a you know blood sugar spike so continue that's i think the the energy drop after eating like unknowingly led me to understanding blood sugar balance mm -hmm. which now is like one of the first tiers like i'm like when women come to me and i'm like you are eating crazy i don't even have them cut anything out i just start with balancing your blood sugar because that is your it affects everything. Right. I mean, it's going to affect your cortisol. If you're struggling to lose weight, you know, your insulin's all over the place. It's going to affect then your progesterone. So I'm like, we need to just start with something. And it's not as stressful because we're not cutting things out. We're not feeling like we're restrictive. And I think, especially with diet culture today, it's very important to support the mental health as you are going through a health journey. And that was one of the biggest things lacking from the care that I got from my providers was super restrictive diets and not like letting you understand like right. how this is affecting my body. Instead, totally. it was a piece of paper, eat this, don't eat this. Right. Yeah. And you just, you start labeling food as good and bad. And if you eat a food that's on the bad list and you're going, this is bad for me, guess how you think it's going to affect you? Exactly. You're going to get bloated. You're going to get constipated. And you're like, yep, it's bad for me because your mind's that powerful. No doubt about it. I tell, I tell people when they find us that 50% of this journey is going to be clinical and 50% of this healing journey is going to be emotional, mental, spiritual, self-development. And some of them are kind of like... But again, by the time they find us and find you, they've tried all the like magic pill stuff. So once they understand that, especially in the hormone world, right? I mean, it's just crazy how emotions can play a role into that. So you start you start refining things slowly and surely. And I'm yeah. guessing that your system starts to respond appropriately. Yeah, I actually started having regular cycles. They were still extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And I had a very short luteal phase. So luteal phase is ovulation to period. Um, you want it to be about 12 days. That tells you you have enough progesterone, you have enough to sustain a pregnancy. And mine was eight. So we were ovulating, but we still had really low progesterone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, still not going to be able to get pregnant here because I have no progesterone. Right. And that is when I started, I found the work of like Dr. Um, Laura Bryden, who is really big in the hormone, hormone space. Okay. And I started learning, okay, like there's certain foods that can actually affect your hormones. I'm like, okay, why didn't someone teach me this? Right. <laughs> and learning how to support my liver which was massive because I did have the MTHFR gene mutation, but you know, nobody taught me how to take care of that. Yeah. Right. So I kind of just kept going down this journey. I started, you know, learning how to use nutrition to support the rise and fall of my hormones, how to start like managing and optimizing my sleep. Yeah. And I started to have energy, like my skin cleared up. I started having regular bowel movements. My liver was working okay. and I lengthened my luteal phase to 12 days Beautiful. and I had completely painless periods and then I got pregnant. Boom. And I was terrified. I thought I was going to miscarry because I, I hadn't had that many cycles yeah. that were good. Sure. So I was like, did I fix it? What's going on here? Yeah. Um, but we didn't. We have a healthy baby boy. He's uh, how old is he? Good. Yeah, he is two and a half. Time for baby number two. He's doing four weeks. Let's go. Yeah. Congratulations, <laughs> you guys. That is yeah. so cool. So give me an idea for you from the time... From the time you realized that exogenous progesterone was not the ticket and you realized that, oh, I, uh, I'm i not ovulating, from that time until the time that you lengthened your luteal to 12 days, just so people can kind of understand a runway, 
Roughly mm-hmm. how much, well, how long was that for you, Leah? It was about a year and a half. Okay, um, so, so I'm going to pump the brakes. So for yeah. listeners, she said a year and a half. She didn't say 30 days. She didn't say 60 days. Yeah. It took time. And it, it see, what we also heard her say though so far is it took her time to get unwell. Right, we had we had a, a high stress, athletic, demanding upbringing with crappy food and, uh, you know, some some toxicity, and then and then it got to that point, and she did all kind. And also, let's not discount the fact that the gut. I mean, I don't even though they didn't fix your periods, we can't say that they did nothing for you. So even you laid yeah. a lot of groundwork also. So it wasn't like you went from the McDonald's drive up to, you know, a, a 12 day luteal phase in, in a year and That's a half. True. So what I'm really trying to tell couples and, and women, especially that are listening to this is you got to be patient. And I tell people like your timeline, whatever the hell timeline you have in your head, I'm going to ask to take that from you because you, if you have this ticking talk clock thing in your head, uh, that doesn't work. And like, there's such an emotional conversation to this. So, so good for you. So now you are, you're a mama. And then, um, and obviously I assume, you know, you get two, two kid or one kid and one kid on the way here and your body is doing yeah. it the right way. Imagine number one, I guess, respectfully, you would have, you'd have been an infertility case, right? Because yeah, you'd, they'd have been like, oh, you can't get pregnant. And then give me an example. And I'm not sure if you play in this world much. What, what does an average couple pay to walk through the fertility journey. Do you have some insight inside of that? So I don't I don't work in that space at all, okay. but I've heard some numbers from other practitioners because I just talked with a few and I mean you're you're looking at a minimum of $40,000. Undoubtedly. I have a family that did over $200,000 to have a kiddo. So yeah. yeah, that's that's wild. So okay, so you um so you at what point then do you decide Wow, this is like my life's calling. Like, when was that? When was the? When was that cloak laid on your back? Um, and you're like, okay, like I, this is it. Like, I didn't initially choose this. I'd love to sing and play piano, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna help women live live a life that they're designed to live. You know, I literally think it's as you said, like it was placed on me mm-hmm. because I just, I was very not a TMI person and I would talk to anybody and anybody about periods and especially as I was learning more about it and I started to have friends be like how did you track your cycle like how did you know that was going on like how did you know you weren't ovulating and so just for kicks I was like I'll do a free challenge and I'll like teach you guys and so I did a free challenge online and then people were like Oh, well, how do you work? How do we work with you? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? How do you work with me? Right. <laughs> I don't you, have anything for you. You want voice lessons? Like, what are we going to do here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we can do some <laughs> piano here. Yeah. Um, so I just started with the basics, like the foundations of like, let's remove inflammatory food, just starting to educate on that. And it just was gaining so much traction. And I was like, okay, I need, um, I keep sending people to their doctors for labs and I'm like, I need to be able to get you more labs because a lot of times doctors will turn you down, unfortunately. And so that's when I looked into becoming uh, FDN. I had actually met um, one of my friends who is an FDN because I had her run a hair mineral analysis. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, this is the coolest test ever. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to do this. So I became an FDN and I like, I mean, nose to the grindstone. I was like in my books, like every single night, I'm like, I will finish this course as fast as humanly possible. Um, And it was a lot. It's it's a lot of information, Mm -hmm. but I'm so thankful that I had that because I was so focused, you know, on hormones and understanding your cycle and FDN gave me this very well-rounded, like, no, you also need to learn about parasites and you need to learn about mold and you need to learn about the gut and you need to learn about the cascade of symptoms. And so it taught me so much and it taught me how to run and read labs. And so that opened up like a whole new aspect to my business at this Mm -hmm. point, because now I was able to run functional labs. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't just like, do you want like a, you know, a thyroid panel and we're going to fight with your doctor until we're both bruised in the face to try and get your antibodies tested or we can just do it ourselves. Exactly. So talking about labs and hormones, when, during what phase of the cycle do you like to have labs ran? 
So it depends on what you want to test. Ooh. So I would say typically if I am just wanting like a basic hormone panel, like we're not getting super fancy, you want to run it five to seven days after ovulation yeah. because then I can get a read on your progesterone mm -hmm. and I can see that ratio of estrogen to progesterone. Yeah. But, you know, if you're needing to test, for example, FSH or LH hormone, you need to be doing that earlier in your cycle. Right. So FSH is going to be around cycle day three and LH, you have a very short window for LH. Interesting. You know, you have like, like it spikes literally 24 to 48 hours before you ovulate. So you really need to be in tune with your cycle okay. so that you can test accordingly because it is so common to go into the doctor and they may know like, Hey, like I want to test this after ovulation, but everybody thinks that you ovulate on day 14. And that's like, it's just it, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they say, Hey, come in on day 20 and we'll test your progesterone and we'll test your hormones. Well, I, for example, ovulate on day 17. So that would not be a great like marker for my health. They would tell me I have all sorts of issues. So you are so. teaching your clients how to track their cycles so that you can know exactly when you're getting these readings so that, because I was taught in my functional medicine training, like day 18 to 22 is when you draw them, because that's yep. making the assumption that there's a 14 day that they have to let on day 14. That's yeah. wild. And everyone's cycle is different. Like the, it's such a myth that you ovulate on day 14 because the, the only part that you really want to be the same length is luteal phase. You want that to be 12 to 14 days. Okay. So after ovulation, but the phase of your cycle, so you have four phases, the phase of your cycle that influences the length is follicular. So talk through those quick, give us a little map of the four phases of yeah. the cycle. So your period is going to be phase one. And that's when you're bleeding and yep. that should be three to seven days. Okay? okay. Less than three estrogen might not be coming up enough. So you're not creating a strong enough uterine lining longer than that. Maybe too much estrogen, not enough progesterone. So already just by tracking your cycle, you're starting to go, Hmm, I know what I should talk to my doctor about. Right. And so that's your period. And then you head right into what's called your follicular phase, your follicles getting ready to release the egg. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the phase that determines the length of your cycle. Some people, this is five days. For some people, it's a lot longer. So like for me, I would have a three to five day period. And then I ovulated on day 17. So I have a long follicular phase. Mm -hmm. So I had a longer cycle overall. But some people will ovulate on day 13 or 14. So they have a very short follicular phase. Mm. And then once those follicles are ready, so it's all brain communication, your brain's like, Hey, ovaries start like getting ready and producing that estrogen. And then your ovaries are like, brain, we have enough estrogen. And your brain's like, okay, release LH hormone. And you're in your ovulatory phase. So you, this is typically when you're starting to create cervical mucus, mm -hmm. you know, which is what keeps sperm alive because literally otherwise sperm is just killed off because of the pH. So mm -hmm. cervical mucus serves its purpose. Right. And then you ovulate and now your temp comes up. And this is where tracking your cycle, you understand if you ovulated because once you start producing progesterone, it raises your body temp. So when your follicle that was getting ready for this egg, like releases the egg, that follicle now forms what's called your corpus luteum, mm -hmm. which produces progesterone and it raises your body temp. Okay. You also can burn up to like an extra 300 calories per day. So that's cool. When you are in follicular phase? No, when you're in your when you're luteal, luteal phase. Luteal. So when, when progesterone's yeah, progesterone. cooking. Yeah. So just to pump the brakes a second, how do you instruct? Is there a kit? Is there a go buy a basal body temperature thing? Is there an app? Like what is the simplest way for a woman to track their cycle? I mean, there's so many ways depending on like how your brain kind of can work around it. Yeah. But I will say the cheapest is a basal body temp. Like you can get it for $10 at your local grocery store. So Erin, are you doing first morning, like yep, before you get morning. out of bed, like track stuff? Yeah. You have that um, thermometer, put it on your alarm clock. Alarm clock goes off. You stick it in your mouth, wait for it to go beep, beep, beep. And then you take that temp 
and you put it in a period tracking app or you can put it on paper. doesn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. But it is important to turn off on your period tracking app the predictions because they mess with your head. Totally. You know, they'll be like, hey, you aren't ovulating or you ovulated this day and you're looking at your temps and you're like, it says I ovulated, but I don't see a temp spike. And that's because the app is following an algorithm. Exactly. So it's only going off of data that you have given it. Okay. So you need to learn to interpret it yourself. So that's where like, you're going to need a couple cycles to kind of be yes. like, oh, I'm consistently seeing a temp rise at around day 18. So I must be ovulating the day before. So right. once you like, I think the first couple temps, you're kind of just like, this is, I don't know what I'm looking at. But once you have a couple cycles under your belt, then you start to understand it. And you'll understand what your temps mean to you. Because mm-hmm. like for some people, you'll find Hmm. When I go to bed later, I have a higher body temp the next morning. I drink alcohol, have a higher body temp. So you start to interpret the nuances. Right. And then you also have women measure their cervical mucus. Like when they go to the restroom, you have them. You know, I, I don't get really into that. I'm just like, if you see it, great. We know it's there. It exists. Like typically you'll see it before ovulation. If they're like, I've never seen cervical mucus ever, that is a red flag. Because I know we think about cervical mucus only in terms of fertility, but like your fertility is your health. And if you have low cervical mucus, either are you deficient in vitamin A? Are you dehydrated? Are you not creating enough estrogen? All things to look into. Good stuff. Okay. So you just, we left off at a 300 calorie per day spike during that luteal phase. And then where do we roll from there? You literally are in your luteal phase, which is your fourth phase at that point. So you had your period, follicular, ovulatory, and now you're in your luteal phase. You are burning more calories. Um, Your cortisol is a little bit higher during this time too. So that is something you want to kind of take into note if you are looking at labs during that time. Okay. Um, You are not as sensitive to insulin. So a little bit more of a blood sugar roller coaster. Um, And this is the phase that I would say 80% of women I work with have issues with because of your your cortisol, progesterone, stress response. I really think has such a big thing to do with it. Uh, This is such good stuff. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to spit fire around you here a little bit. You know, I'm 20 years into this game and I've heard all kinds of things. The most common thing that I hear from women in their cycle journey is their doctor just slaps on the old birth control. Oh. Right? Like your yeah. cycles are off. Hey, that's no problem. We'll just give you birth control. Mm-hmm. Talk to me why you may disagree with that approach. I have, I don't have any reason to agree with that. Okay. So I, love it. I don't, you can speak frankly here, by the way, just so you know. Okay. I don't like mean this disrespectfully to doctors, but I have had medical doctors on my podcast and I ask him this question. And I truly think that it, I mean, I want to say it's lazy doctoring, but like you don't become a doctor because you're lazy. So I think it really goes back to like their education system of what they are taught. And if they don't continue to educate themselves outside of that, they're just taught, you know, what is in the medical books. And you get seven minutes for a visit respectfully. So even if they're good people that are inside of a bad system, I mean, that's the reality. Exactly. So, and a lot of times their hands are tied too, you know, and which is frustrating, but If you think about it, you have hormonal issues. What is going to regulate your hormonal issues? Ovulation, because that is how you produce progesterone, which keeps estrogen in check. So your egg quality is so important. Your nutrients, so important. Birth control, it it just, you are put into menopause. The hormones on birth control resemble menopause. And I, it just blows my mind that that's what they're given because I'm like, if you are trying to regulate your cycle, you're trying to get painless periods, you need good egg quality. Right. You need a strong ovulation. You need a good corpus luteum. So why on earth are we going to shut down the one thing you need that not only like <laughs> murders your hormones, but it depletes right. you of necessary vitamins and minerals. And so then you're like, okay. I was on birth control for four or five, six months. Now I wanted to get pregnant. 
And the doctor's like, that's fine. Just stop your birth control. And you come off of it. And you're like, well, where's my cycle? Or it comes back with a vengeance. Totally. And then you're trying to get pregnant and you're depleted of all of these necessary vitamins and minerals that you need to support a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I just, if I could just squash one thing, it would be birth control because Damn. nobody, you, they don't look anywhere else. Like, it's just like, oh, birth control. And it's like, no, why don't you look somewhere else for something that doesn't have so many side effects? Totally, totally. Man, that that is, you just dropped some bombs right there. And I'm so grateful because I, the, I would assume the percentage of women that have been on birth control for acne or amenorrhea or, or menorrhagia are just, it's crazy. That's wild. Another yeah. quite common, because I get to have some very frank conversations with women is libido or lack thereof, mm-hmm. dare I say. So how would you how would you encourage our listeners or maybe have a frank conversation around that? Because that again, there's a it's very multifactorial, I'm sure. Libido is tricky because I think a big part of libido is mental health. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big one. Mm -hmm. But then also something that really impacts your testosterone and your androgens is blood sugar imbalance and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, I feel like a lot of times if you struggle with libido, what do people say? Just drink a glass of wine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Inhibit yourself. That's not really going to help the solution here. And so whenever we're struggling with libido, I always want to run a Dutch panel because I want to see what pathways your androgens are going down because you may have like, you know, low, low um, androgens, but maybe they're going down the wrong pathway. So we want to take a look there or maybe you have so much inflammation. We're just not doing what we need to. So your sulfation is really low. So I always want to run that and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I like running a hair mineral analysis and I want to see like, how is your body responding and utilizing minerals? Sure. Because you need those nutrients to make hormones. Totally. And so those are like two things in like the medicine field, but then just in general, I'm going to tell you probably to not drink alcohol. I'm so sorry. There's some great other options out there. Totally. Totally. And balance your blood sugar. Yeah, that's because so good. if you can just simplify it, I am just grateful for this conversation. Lee, we're going to probably have to do like part two and part three as we journey because this is these are real answers and, and these are not magic pills. Yet what I hear what I hear you saying is I am here to empower women with tools yeah. so that they can. I, I said to myself years ago as a clinician, I want no one to ever say to me, "How come you never told me about that." So, um, by the way, if you're listening, if you guys listen to this, we're going to have all the information in the show notes about things that we're talking about, uh, wrapping up here. Gosh, we're 50 minutes into this thing. So give me an idea of how do people find you? Yeah, I'm on all the social media platforms. I think, unless I don't know of some that exist, right. um, Leah underscore B R U E G. So you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, all the good stuff. And I have a podcast as well, um, Balancing Hormones Naturally. And those would probably be the two places where you can get the most info. And then if people want to work with you, what? how does that world look like? Or what, what are you, are you currently yeah. accepting clients? Or what does that world look like for you? Not at this moment. About to head into maternity leave. Um, oh, so, but we do have a wait list. So I have two ways that um, women can work with me. I have a signature like hormone reset program which is a group coaching program that we run a couple times per year. And it's very focused on like your foundations, you know, so let's get rid of the fancy stuff. You know, let's not talk about all the millions of supplements. Let's work on your foundations and build your body up. And then I do one-on-one coaching. So that's for the women, you know, who have been sick for a really long time. And they're like, I would like to run some labs. I want to dig really deep. I want to, you know, get really in touch with what's going on. Man, what a blessing to, for for someone like yourself. And I love most people have a story of their journey. And, you know, we look back to those fibroadenomas of yours, and we're grateful for them because had you we not are. had those, 
Nothing wrong with playing piano and singing in church. I'm all for that. Yet, uh, man, what a, what an awesome calling on your life. So, Leah, I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for what you're doing. I'm grateful that you're a mommy and you're living what you're doing and you're about to bring another soul into this world. Um, knowing that you have all these wonderful eggs, your, your boys will probably be presidents of something someday, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, but true. But again, so grateful for you. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we're going to be circling back for some more podcasts in the future as we have the ultimate goal to empower people around the world. Thank you so much for having me on. All right.